Hey there, thought I would continue. I'm on my way to a wedding and it's kind of a drive, so uh, I thought I would continue with um, Corinthians. Um, let me pull up the thing here. Now, we've been talking about how we were called into the body. The last message, I really didn't get to the point of the last message till the, the end. And in case you didn't listen to the end, the point was the problem, the first problem for fellowship at Corinth was uh, I am for Christ rather than not I but Christ. Um, you had people, there were divisions, okay, in the fellowship. Uh, and you had people saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Apollos. Then there were some sport, more spiritually minded people that said, well, I'm not following any teachers. I don't, we don't need teachers. We, I, I'm for Christ. He's my shepherd. I'm the spiritual one. And they would divide themselves from the divisive ones by uh, asserting their own spirituality and maturity. And I am for Christ is just as much of a problem as I am for Paul, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, because what you're saying is I'm the real disciple and these people aren't, and it's another division. It's another source of distinctions in the body. No, it's not I am for Christ. It's not I but Christ. And that's why he's going to talk about them. The first thing he starts talking about is the cross of Christ and the preaching of the cross. Um, now, the other problem was human eloquence. Remember, they were very gifted in utterance. They confirmed the testimony um, and so he knew they were all saved, but, but just because you are gifted at contending for the testimony of Christ doesn't mean that you know the first thing about being the, being the testimony. There, there is the testimony of the word, which points to Christ, but then that's supposed to produce a fellowship and that many people don't understand that. They believe we are called to just contend for doctrine and truth uh, and fight it out but that's the end of their view It's so the doctrine of Christ becomes an argument which that's not what it was supposed to be the doctrine of Christ the teaching of the apostles is for the fellowship we write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus Christ and here Paul after telling them that the testimony of Christ is confirmed in them and the way he knows it is because they've got utterance so he knows what they say about Jesus Christ he knows that they have the testimony of Christ abiding in them God's record concerning his son he knows they're sealed with the spirit he knows they believe the gospel based on what they say and they've got meetings that give them opportunities to speak and then he tells them you are called God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. I don't think we have any idea how significant that is. The reason God sent the doctrine of Christ was to testify of Christ so we would believe in Christ so that we would be brought into the fellowship. And the fellowship is with the Father and with the Son and with the Apostles. So in the book of Acts, it says that they broke bread from house to house and continued in the teaching and the fellowship of the apostles. The teaching should produce a fellowship. Uh, that's the purpose of the teaching, is to gather us into a fellowship, and then we become a testimony. And Jesus said, you know, by this shall all men you'll know you're my disciples, that you have one love for one another. And that is not a demand. Because that's in the context of John 17 where he's talking about that the Father kept them in his name and the Son declared the name of the Father, Abba Father, and brought them into the fellowship. And he desires that they would behold his glory and that the love of the Father would be in them. And for that purpose he sent them the truth which is the word and he says sanctify them in thy truth. The word, the washing of the word brings us the knowledge of Jesus Christ so that we can be brought into the fellowship. And in the fellowship, there's the love of God, okay? It's not that we are commanded to love each other as a burden to take up. It's that the, 
testimony should produce the fellowship and in the fellowship the love flows a lot of people who are brought being brought into fellowship right now um, are testifying that you know when I was in the institutional church I could never love anybody and now I can see that it's because the doctrine of Christ wasn't present the testimony wasn't front first and foremost the testimony produces a realm the testimony produces a fellowship and the spirit bears witness with that testimony that we are sons and heirs and it also allows us to know who else is sons and heirs when you're in the institutional church and no one's given an opportunity to speak you don't know who's tearing wheat and we can't adulterate our love and set our affections on wolves it doesn't work so your love returns to you and you can feel that you can feel that your love does not go out to these people and then you think something's wrong with you well jesus said we're supposed to love one another no the love is in the fellowship and this is love not that we loved him but that he gave he loved us and gave his son for us that we may live through him so the fellowship is everything and the fellowship is another kind of testimony there's the testimony of the word which draws us into the fellowship and then there's our enjoyment of the fellowship which produces a fellowship <laughs> our testimony and if you want to look at it in, in the light of the seven churches there's christ the uh, high priest standing in the midst of the lampstands and he is they are the expression of him he's the one shining the shining is coming out from his face and his eyes and his eyes are actually the lamps the, the fire burning on the lampstands uh, but the lampstand is the church and the church's light is being obscured by all kinds of problems in the fellowship that are addressed in epistles and the answer is always the doctrine of Christ the testimony of Christ which is given first to the stars who are the messengers um, so when the lampstand is not shining very brightly because the fellowship is damaged because people are have all kinds of problems the stars of the messengers are the ones that shine uh, and they hold the message and they deliver that message to the church but those th that would be like the apostles at the time of the apostasy the lampstands weren't shining very brightly but the apostles were still shining very brightly and John wrote in a time of apostasy when Antichrist have infiltrated Ephesus and they, their lampstand is in danger of being removed because they've left their first love. He says, we write these things to you that you may have fellowship with us and our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And what did he write him? He wrote him about the testimony of God concerning his Son, the eternal word of life. The life that was manifested is what we declare, the word of life. And defines what is a believer and how you know if you have, have eternal life focusing on that getting back to the beginning that which was in the beginning brings you back to the fellowship and then when multiple saints come into that fellowship based on the testimony they become a lampstand which is another kind of testimony it's another kind of shining and we said that the apostles writing was for the restoration of the saints to the fellowship it has nothing to do you know addressing the sins in the churches had nothing to do with the eternal salvation of the believers they were already saved it, what they were dealing with was problems for the fellowship that were damaging the fellowship and therefore reducing the shining of the testimony and that's what the Satan attacks he attacks the messengers but then he attacks the church as well and he has all kinds of devices against the church and one of them is just general blindness that people don't see why we're here we are not called here to argue with wolves we're called here to draw people to the feast invite them to the feast you know there's a difference um, between winning an argument and showing someone a point so that they used to believe this thing but now they believe that thing and bringing people into the pasture where there's food and rest and that's what we have when you have the fellowship and the problem is, is there's been very little fellowship very little because the testimony has been damaged and so people are on their own and they're just out there you know contending which is good but now there's a testimony the church and a, and a genuine fellowship 
And so there's a motive to invite people to something that's more than just winning an argument. I'm not just trying to win an argument with you. I'm winning you to Christ, betrothing you to him. And he says, we present, we, whom we present, Christ, teaching every man and admonishing every man in all wisdom that we may present every man full grown in Christ, who is the head out from whom the whole body grows, being richly supplied by the joints of bands. It says that in Colossians. We're, we're not just trying to win an argument and say, hey, you used to believe that the King James translation wasn't good and you were reading the NIV, but now you know the uh, King James translation is right. And then we think, well, I saved them from that error. But where are they now? Oh, I don't know. I moved on to the next argument. You know, that's not what we're here for. We're here for a, uh, to be porters for the shepherd's voice to open the door to the pasture, which is the fellowship. And people should be brought along and should have a hunger and a thirst for more. The more they experience the testimony of Christ, the more they're going to want the genuine fellowship. And once you've got a genuine lampstand where the Lord is moving among the people, now you've got something to invite them to. Now you're not just trying to win an argument. You're actually trying, you've got a feast and you're excitedly trying to invite someone. You know, telling the gospel to people who just, okay, you're going to go to heaven when you die. There's a limited amount of motive behind that, uh, unless you're a zealot. But saying, I'm part of, I'm, I'm in this beautiful fellowship. We are members of one another. And this is the expression of the body of Christ on earth. And the Lord is really moving in our midst. That's something to invite people to. There's a table laid for us in the presence of the enemy where the anointing flows. And the members are all one. Okay. Now this is something worth fighting for that most people don't even see. So when they read Corinthians, all they look at because we're so individualistic, me too, uh, we look at our individual Christian life and we're out here fighting the wolves and when we read Corinth, we're just trying to figure out who's saved and who's not. Is the brother who had sex with his father's wife, is he saved? Are the people going to the temple prophet, prostitutes saved? You know, they, we don't look at it as Paul is not worried about that. He's got that settled because he knows what's out of their mouth concerning Christ. What he's worried about is that the fellowship is being ravaged and when you see it that way you realize that this is not a church that just is carnal and has all kinds of problems with sin this is the testimony of God on earth a lampstand being raised up and the enemy is attacking it through on every side and using their ignorance of his devices to really toss them about and that's the purpose of this letter is to bring them back to the fellowship, beseeching them as an ambassador of Christ to be reconciled to God in their minds concerning all their doctrinal issues where they're not seeing Christ and the enjoyment of Christ and the fellowship as the goal. Okay, so the first problem was because they didn't see the body and their biggest sin is addressed at the table meeting. He says, you know, there's some of you getting sick and dying because you're not discerning the body. And that's not talking about discerning the importance of the Lord's table. That's talking about discerning the members of the body of Christ and knowing the new creation and knowing the fellowship as opposed to just operating as a rogue. Okay. Um, now, the people who say, I am of Cephas, I am of Apollos, I am of Christ, are rogues. Why? Because they're in the flesh. How do I know they're in the flesh? Because they're not saying, not I, but Christ. They're saying, I'm of man. Or I am a man you know I'm of this great teacher or I want to be a great teacher or I want to be a genuine disciple and they think of everything in terms of their own pursuit and their own ambition to be spiritual and that's the source of the problems at Corinth the carnality that comes in is because of a basic blindness that keeps them from enjoying the flow of the fellowship where holiness and love and light is See, when you've got the fellowship and it's richly flowing, it's much easier. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us of all sin. We have fellowship with one another. There's a practical washing 
We wash each other's feet in the fellowship and we are protected and there's an armor and there's a order and there's the kingdom manifested in, to a certain extent. Righteousness, peace, and joy of the Holy Spirit in the fellowship. And there's a testimony. Uh-oh. My phone is too hot. I'm going to have to pause this. So anyway, now my wedding's done. Let's see if I can go any further uh, with what I was saying here. Um, so the problem was not I... Uh, I'm sorry, I am for Christ, or I am of Christ, and not uh, not I, but Christ. And the requirement for fellowship, it, to be with the saints uh, in fellowship, is a kind of self-denial, not like austerity, but to recognize, you know, well, let's look at Romans 12. This is the what Romans 12 is talking about. I beseech you, therefore... Brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present yourself whole, uh, your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Now it's interesting, it's plural bodies, but one sacrifice. Individually, we present ourselves to God as, as holy and acceptable based on the truths that we are crucified with Christ and raised together with Him. That's supposed to be a settled matter before we can enter the body life. Um, but then, it's he's, he's beseeching a group of people to present their bodies, plural, as a living sacrifice, single. That's a little deeper than what we've talked about. But if you want to talk about the fellowship and the one body... And we are one bread, uh, and we're members one of another. This is what it means. And to present ourselves holy and acceptable means that we know that we are acceptable on the finished work of Jesus Christ, and holy because of the sanctifying work of Jesus Christ. And He is our acceptance before God. And not only that, but we are members one of another. Um, and he says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and perfect and acceptable will of God. For I say through the grace given to me that every man that is among you not think of himself more highly than he ought, but think soberly according as God has given or dealt to every man the measure of faith. Now that's not talking about in the world everybody has a measure of faith and they can believe in whatever. No, the measure of faith is in the body of Christ. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. Um, and it's in once you've believed the gospel there are some who are weak in faith some who are strong in faith and we're to think of ourselves soberly as members of the body of Christ and as one living sacrifice and we're to present our bodies uh, in order to be built up together One, but, but again this only applies if you've found a group of people that is fellowshipping on the ground of the testimony if there's no testimony this does not apply so don't listen to the pastors who are yelling at you that this means you need to go to institutional church and pay your tithe. This is not talking about that at all. This is talking about a group of people who are brought into fellowship and knit together in love because of the testimony uh, and they're members in the fellowship. But he says, for as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ and every one members of another. This is a different concept because the world, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, is I'm a living sacrifice. I'm for Christ. I'm saved. And I've got my spiritual life, and it's me and Jesus, and it's my walk with Jesus, and who are you to tell me? That's, you know, what Romans 12 through 16 is talking about is the body life, and how do we keep the unity, how do we not cause issues for the fellowship, and it's first being renewed to see that, number one, I'm crucified with Christ. Number two, I have the life of Christ in me as the Spirit, and I'm to live by the Spirit, not by law. And then number three, I'm a member of the body, and to present myself with the others as a living sacrifice and be renewed to see that, look, I'm not just here for myself and my spirituality. I'm here for the body, and we're members one of another. So... And then he talks about the gifts. Now, this is this problem at Corinth. They all had different gifts, especially with when it comes to utterance. And divisions were being produced 
based on everybody saying, I'm for Paul, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Christ, and it's all I, I, I. But the Christian life is not I, but Christ. The Christian life is, I'm a living sacrifice. I've been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ in me. And Christ is the head of a body, not just the savior of individuals. And we don't even know how to think like that because we're Americans or Western and we have an individualistic culture and everything. Uh, to lay our soul life down for the brethren, not it is totally alien for, to our concept. Um, so in Corinth, the problem is an attack on the fellowship the sins are being dealt with because of their effect on the fellowship, not because of just their effect on a sinner. Yes, they damage you, but see, even that, most of the time when we talk about discipline, we talk about, uh, you know, we talk about um, the Christian life and God dealing with you, it's all about you. But Paul's not dealing with you, he's dealing with the body. And we've got to see that, and I'm going to drive it home a lot. He's dealing with the fellowship, and we need to have our mind renewed before we can even understand the letter of 1 Corinthians. Otherwise, we'll just look at it like, oh, well, that guy's a sinner, and that guy's a sinner, and that guy sinned, and that guy, is that guy saved, or is that guy saved? That's not what that's about. It's what he's, he's laboring to bring them in corporately into the fellowship, and he's identifying problems for the fellowship, the first of which is the gifts uh, have made a problem two areas. Number one, you got people saying, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Apollo. So the gifted ones have become the object of attention. And number two, um, the ones who say, I'm of Christ, are pursuing Christ, yeah, but it's according to earthly wisdom. So they're, they're not transformed, they're not renewed in the spirit of their mind to see that they're just members of one another, members of the body, and everything they do is a division because they're kind of rogue. Uh, they, their gifts are their pursuit. That's the problem in Corinth. And that leads to all kinds of carnality and also brings them into bondage to the more gifted people who exalt themselves above the fellowship and beat them. <laughs> uh, so he starts to talk about the word of the cross versus worldly wisdom and worldly wisdom is what I can do. But the body of Christ is not what I can do, but not I, but Christ. And that's called the mystery of Christ. And he calls it the hidden wisdom, which is foolishness to the world and, uh, and weakness to the world. So that's what he's going to talk about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's identifying this problem of giftedness, worldly wisdom, and selfish pursuit of spiritual prowess or development apart from a realization of the body of Christ. That's the problem at Corinth. And that's the problem everywhere. That's our problem. Especially since we live in a day where it's almost impossible to find any fellowship, so of course we're going to develop on an individualistic line. But then when we actually confront a situation where there is a pastor and fellowship, are we able to adapt to it? Because it is totally different than what we thought. And what worked for us individually often doesn't work corporately. It becomes a problem corporately. It becomes a problem for fellowship. Even our spirituality, even our I am of Christ, becomes a problem in the fellowship. Um, okay, I have to go. Uh, I just wanted to kind of wrap that up.